Hey folks, it's Adam Summer from the Heartland Pod. This week on the show, I've got an opening statement about the importance of November 9th. Then Rachel Parker, Sean Diller, and guest host Ray Reed will join me for talking politics and we'll cover Missouri's extraordinary session, the open embrace of fascism, the GOP's abortion message morphing, and the Senate Electoral Count Act. Lots to get to, so let's go. Welcome back to the Heartland Pod. My name is Adam Summer, and I am your host. If you're brand new, thank you all for joining us. We're so glad to have you with us. And of course, those of you, the potheads, who come back time and time again, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you so much. You can find us, of course, on the social media with The Heartland Pod. That works on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and even TikTok. You can email us anytime at heartlandpod2020 at gmail.com. To you book a guest or with questions or information, and we'd love to hear from you. You can also find links to all of our shows and a link to sign up for our Patreon over at heartlandpod.com. There's a link in the show notes for that always. If you want to support our independent family of shows, we are working hard to help change the conversation here in the Heartland. You can do that by going to heartlandpod.com and clicking the Patreon link to get signed up over there. Just two bucks a month. You can support us, and at 5 bucks a month, you unlock all kinds of extra stuff, extra shows, and things like that. Uh, we will, of course, have a, a live stream for our patrons. So uh, coming up, uh, election night is coming up. We will live stream that night, uh, and that's a patron-only thing. So get signed up over there if you want to join us for that. And uh, I think uh, already talking to some folks behind the scenes, I think we'll have some fun people on with us. So not to be missed. Uh, We do have shows for you five days a week, so you can start here on your Monday for analysis, get interviews Tuesdays and Thursdays, and a rotation of shows on Wednesdays between the high country from Sean Diller covering the Mountain West and the Delta, a look into the intersection of family education, science, and politics with Nicholas and Christina Linke. Then finish your week with Kevin Smith on the Friday Flyover View every week with a roundup of Heartland news and views. And it's a great Friday, too, because it's it's usually less than 20 minutes long, and you just get a bunch of information. Uh, and, And Kevin's got a really nice, you know, he's just got a nice way about doing it. It's a nice listen. So catch us five days a week. Tell your friends. Share us, send somebody the link, text it to them, whatever. Uh, Bring them on in because we're a growing family and we love having every single one of you. On this show, you'll hear from me, and uh, I'm a lawyer in West Central Missouri, just east of Kansas City. We have Rachel Parker, who's a writer, marketing pro, and Sean Diller, who is one of my oldest friends and is a political operative. That's where our analysis comes from. And this week, we have Ray Reed joining us as a guest host. Ray uh, has a various experiences working in and around government uh, and then recently ran in the Democratic primary for the Missouri 2nd District. Uh, He has spent a bunch of time recently uh, speaking at different colleges and uh, going and learning about the process with some elected folks in D.C. So lots to give us, lots of insight for us uh, there, and we're very excited to have that. So we'll get to the talk in politics in just a minute. And now I have my opening statement uh, about how November 9th is coming, and it might be more important than November 8th. On November 8th, 2022, folks will go to the polls for the midterm election. Most likely, the Republican Party will win the House, and the Democrats will retain the Senate at the national level. Lots of races you're watching at the state level, regardless of your state, will be decided, and ones you care about might not go the way you want. Maybe a candidate you've given money to, maybe even volunteered for, will lose. On social media, I see a fairly steady barrage of Democratic blue wave messaging and folks who are hoping to win the House uh, with some kind of monumental voter surge due to the Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade. It's true that voter registration went up after that case. It's true that the overall nature of this midterm has shifted from a traditional in-party loss, which is the norm, to one where the in-party will do better than normal. That's what the signs point to right now. But it's unlikely that such a surge will overcome the gerrymandered districts designed to allow for safe and easy victories for one party over another. While gerrymandering is not exclusively a Republican issue, in an election year like this, its impact will be unmistakably tilted as an advantage for Republicans in states where the autocracy has taken hold. It means that when you wake up on November 9th, you might feel disappointed. You might even feel like you've lost a race that you should have won. You might feel like none of the work you did made a difference in the outcome, and that may lead you to not want to do any of it again. And if on November 9th, you stop engaging, stop caring, if you let disappointment put out your fire, then you'll have been right. Your work won't make a difference, but 
not because it can't. I love to float. And for those of you outside of Missouri who don't know, we have some amazing rivers here. My favorite floats were ones where we would float a full day, 10 plus miles, then find a sandbar to camp, do another 10 miles the next day. I love getting the fire going. It's so satisfying once it's going. And you have to build it you know, fast enough to keep it growing, but slow enough to keep from smothering it, putting it out. And when it starts to fail, you've got to get down. You've got to carefully blow that air through the bottom and make sure it gets going. And once it's burning well, you can add those larger pieces of wood and eventually the logs that allow you to sit back and enjoy the fire, enjoy the work that you've done listening as the river trickles by. But if you give up at that moment, that point of no return, if the setback makes you give up, the fire goes out. Right now in states like Missouri, Ohio, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Wisconsin, reasonable folks have a fire going, but the patience to build that fire is important. The resolve to nurture the fire is important. Extremism wants nothing more than for us to give up on the fire before it gets burning well enough for the big logs. Extremism wants us all to stop caring on November 8th. Extremism wins by caring as much about November 9th and each day after as on November 8th. Election day is important. Working from now until then to convince folks to get folks excited, to increase turnout, it all matters. It's what it's all about, but November 8th is not the end. It's just one more event in a constantly running cycle that continues on November 9th and every day after. November 8th is coming, but November 9th is the day you get to decide what the future looks like. Now here's Talking Politics. Talking politics. All right, we are here for talking politics. We've got the crew and a little bit of extra something, something. So I've got Rachel Parker, I've got Sean Diller, uh, but we're going to start with our guest host. Ray Reed is joining us. Uh, if you have listened to this show often, then you've certainly heard from Ray on here. And if you're in Missouri, uh, almost certainly you've heard of Ray. Uh, Ray, man, thanks for joining us. How you doing? I'm good, guys. Thanks. It's great to be here with you. So the the question that always goes with talking politics, what you sipping on, man? <laughs> I'm sipping on some Gatorade. Gatorade Yellow. All right. <laughs> the original, the original. Classic. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. Right on. Well, Ray, uh, Ray's been on a whirlwind tour, so we'll let him interject uh, some of that. But give us give us the highlights, man. What have you been doing these last couple of weeks? Yeah, you know, these last couple of weeks I've just been going wherever I'm asked pretty much, going to high schools, colleges, uh, different parts of the country. Uh, we just finished up uh, some schools on the East Coast. I went to Howard, Fordham University in New York, uh, Columbia University, Boston College, Harvard. Uh, we swooped through uh, back on the way to Chicago, the University of Illinois in Chicago. Now I'm back in St. Louis. Uh, this next trip, we're going to hit the Southwest. So we're going to hit uh, schools in Texas and Nevada and Arizona. Yeah. Sounds like a ton of fun. Dude, some... driving from Texas to Nevada is fucking long. I don't know how, if you've been out West lately. But <laughs> like, <Is it? laughs> that's far. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's we're Nevada. Flying. Sorry, <laughs> Nevada is what I meant to say. Go we're, we're gonna we're gonna fly, so hopefully, uh, there's not too much driving involved. Good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that would be a very long drive. <laughs> oh man, uh, Sean Diller, speaking of, he's here. How you doing, man? What you sipping on? Doing well, doing well. Thanks. Um, I'm sipping on Costco coffee, one lukewarm and one on ice, and. Nice. Um, yeah, the, the week's been really great. I've been reading this awesome book. It's kind of a self-helpy kind of book called The Art of Showing Up by Rachel Wilkerson Miller. And it's fantastic. And she's the best writer. She's super funny, concise. I'm plowing through it. So Nice. Nice. Great. Free plug. You should reach out. Maybe we'll get her on. <laughs> you never know. Rachel Parker, how about you? How you doing? And uh, what you sipping on over there? I'm good. I'm the Rachel that's never written a self-help book that anybody would want to read. <laughs> uh, my art of showing up would be like, um, I'm here. Just be sweaty. That's, that's it. That's, that's my <laughs> just get there. Uh, and the rest of it will solve itself. Is that the whole point of the book, Sean? Is that basically what it says? She does talk about, uh, yeah, um, showing up and being sweaty in different parts. So OK, yeah, good. Okay, there you excellent. Go. excellent. There you go. I'm good. I um, I did go outside a little bit today. 
uh and it was just ex uh, really lovely and um yeah i had a good week um i'm excited about the interview i did this week just to give a, the, everybody a little bit of a sampling yeah. i talked to dr green about his race for the state auditor and he was absolutely lovely and interesting and i could have talked to him for hours um we're lucky to have somebody like that in the race uh so that i hope folks will tune into that and i it's the return of the green flask i'm, oh, it's, uh, back. I'm it's back i found it it's so funny how how much how obvious it was yes last week when i couldn't find it it was <laughs> i asked elliot where it was and he's like it's right there and yeah. i was like oh okay never yeah. mind yeah so, so it's good yeah Crazy, crazy week on this end, getting ready. Two fundraisers this coming up uh, weekend, the 7th in uh, Warrenton, the karaoke fundraiser. Folks, if you're around, 7 o'clock at the Elks Lodge in Warrenton, we're going to have a raucous time. And I think I think one Sean Diller is confirmed for that? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I was. I don't actually know how I'll get out to Warrenton. You know, it's kind of in the boondocks. I don't know yeah. if you know that. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'm we'll, blind in. We'll, we'll um, figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah, I think uh, good. I think a mutual friend from St. Louis who's on the board of the of the uh, charity is also coming out. So hopefully, nice. hopefully oh, the yeah, Spree's himself can can bring it out. Um, yeah. So we've got that on Friday night, and then Saturday the the Rett Syndrome Strollathon in St. Louis. I'll be at that uh, at the JCC off of Limburg in uh, St. Louis. So folks are. Welcome to come out there and support that action, or you can check it out. I've shared some stuff on Twitter if you want to check out a link for that event and uh, be part of Clara's Crusade, my daughter's team. You can give some money there. And uh, Rachel, uh, <laughs> you made a, a donation on it, and I got a text from Spencer uh, Toter with his donation, and he gave one penny more than you. So I just wanted you to know that he did. Uh... <laughs> was, he, was he just trying to show me <laughs> yeah, up? Or... Yeah. He... <laughs> yeah. This is pretty funny. He has way more money than me, so I'm glad that he came a little bit more than I did. It's nice. Thanks, Spencer. All right, well, let's jump in. We got lots to do, so let's jump into our topics here. True or false. All right, for the true or false, we have uh, the Missouri GOP's extraordinary session. Uh, they did some tax cutting. Uh, and the question for the true or false is, could it rebound, basically adding to the momentum for Dems in Missouri, making some seats more competitive than thought before. Uh, for context, the Missouri House, uh, if the Democrats can basically take six seats in this election, it keeps from the Republicans having a supermajority, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, was not necessarily as productive as some of the Republicans wanted. Uh, seems like it was more just to be able to say, hey, we cut taxes and gave some money to farmers. Uh, and the tax cut itself was far too high what was proposed for a lot of people they tried to do a bunch more they tried to do some corporate stuff it didn't work uh, i talked with uh, dan house who's a representative in my district i saw him on friday uh, we were eating lunch at the same place and said aren't you supposed to be somewhere and he said no we're done in the house they passed the farm credits out of the house and they passed the uh, tax bill with no corporate uh, tax change so uh you know is it brown back flation are we you know what what are we going to see here when we when we defund everything instead of just defunding the police, but the Republicans are the ones defunding everything? Uh, Ray, why don't you start us off here uh, this this extraordinary session? So you 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 were spending some time in D.C. recently. Was this extraordinary session, you know, bubbling up to sort of our national legislatures that you were talking with? <laughs> um, I'll be honest, D.C. isn't too. Key, like I keyed in on Missouri because some sure. of those folks they thought that that I won my primary, so they, they <laughs> really weren't <laughs> they really weren't paying attention. Uh, but no, yeah, folks out there, uh, they're not paying too much attention attention to Missouri. Um, but I think it's actually can backfire, but only if we make it. You know, Republicans are setting up Missouri to fail on this one. Um, you know. This is a this is money that we have right now is one time use. Uh, even if you know there were a bunch of Democrats elected to Congress and we have jo like a super Democratic majority at the federal level, they're not sending any more money to the states uh, like we had during the pandemic. Um, so 
it's going to be a, a big problem down the road by just cutting cutting taxes and cutting funding from a bunch of programs. Um, uh, but yeah, like I said, it can backfire, but only if Democrats, you know, capitalize off it uh, with our messaging post this election. Rachel, what about you? Is Rex is Rex Sinkfield happy? Uh, that, I guess that's, <laughs> that's the question. Well, he's right? running. He's running the fucking state. Um, the sink wheel of extraordinary session. Yeah, sink. I, I think yeah. is is sink is happy. Then I guess everybody's happy. Um, our governor is a is a dipshit. Um, I don't know what like. So the, let, let's just re review what an extraordinary session is supposed to be for, right? It's so you can. Um, Oh, let's say that you wanted to, I, I don't know, do you have to call for an extraordinary session when you want to have a special election? I don't know, like, exactly, like, what the wording is in the Missouri Constitution. But it really is to be for, in case of something terrible, like a, an emergency of some kind, right? Right. Um, it's extraordinary. It's not supposed to be so that you can just be like, I want to do a tax cut now. Yeah, and, and we didn't do our work while we were here before we drug it right. out and we're the last day to get our maps done. Right. And um, we didn't get around to cutting taxes. So right. We and he could have called a special <laughs> session to do the maps. Uh, like the, the guy cannot tie his shoelaces. The only thing that he seems to be able to understand is sort of like how to do the bidding of um, very, very, very wealthy donors in Missouri. I, you know, the, the, as far as the, the true false, is this going to backfire? It really is up to voters. I mean, it, it, it's going to hurt them, but I think that a lot of voters on the Republican side are quite cynical right. and the whole, they've been fed this bullshit for so long about government fails you. And so it, it, it always, um, satisfies both sides of the argument when governments defund government serve when when go republicans right. defund government services it it uh, makes their puts more money in their donors pockets i mean the tax cut is not going to give me a dime i don't think i'm going to get any money from i don't think i'm going to see any personal benefit from missouri's tax cut yeah um but somebody that makes like tenfold 15 15 fold 20 fold or something more than me will yeah so it's just you know it's it's uh it, they're not even pretending like it's a good idea. Right. I think they are just trying to distract. I think what Peter said when Peter Meredith, um, my state rep, when he was on with us a couple weeks ago, I think what he said was correct that they're just trying to uh, distract from uh, the abortion ban, which they passed. This is all the stuff they could have stopped from happening if they right, really thought right, about right, it. Right. So do I think it's going to backfire? Um, I'm going to go with what Ray said. If we make it backfire, if we are, if we, we have to be very good storytellers. Um, yeah. we, we have to learn how to, how to sort of help people connect the dots and say like, it's not because they're going to blame this all on teachers unions. When like Missouri students start falling behind because they only have four day school weeks and things like that, they're going to, the, the Republicans in Missouri anyway, are going to blame the teachers unions and we have to be like, no, fuck you. You cut taxes, you assholes, and you don't pay teachers enough. Like, our teachers are the lowest paid in the country. So we have to keep bringing that up, and not just on Twitter. Like, we actually have to get out and, oh, I don't know, change the conversation, I guess. Uh, yeah, so for the context on that conversation you can have with folks, <clears throat> so this is actually from a Missouri Times piece. It does a, a really good job of laying this out. Uh, this is from 2020 because of COVID. There was an, uh, an extraordinary session. So an extraordinary session is called by the governor. It's designed to address a specific topic. Uh, and it is something that is of an extraordinary or necessary and expedient need. So it, it, essentially, that would require that slightly cutting taxes, almost not at all for most folks, and almost completely only for folks who make a lot of money was necessary and expedient to be done to benefit the state of and Missouri giving, right now. And it's giving wealthy people another, like the top income earners are going to get another like 350 to $400 a month. Like, are they right. really going to notice it? Like what the hell is that going to go towards? Like, but they get to say we cut taxes Right. I mean, that's Ray. Isn't that basically what you're going to be hearing from folks as you're talking to them? If you, I mean, you've been, you just went door to door the other day. Was that coming up? Yeah. Uh, they didn't talk much about the tax cut. They just, uh, what I'm hearing most on the doors, I knocked for Trish um, this last week um, in the second district. Um, 
what I'm hearing most is abortion. Uh, there's no doubt, like, come January, February, March, I'm going to be hearing uh, conversations about the tax cut. Um, Interesting. So abortion is, is what's coming up most on folks' minds. What, what kind of – are you getting pushback? Are you getting folks who are unhappy? What kind of what kind of info are you getting? Fired up. And I said, you know, me and Trish talked about it. Um, that's kind of what – uh, is giving her, I think, uh, a big boost heading into the the home stretch here is that there are so many women, especially and young girls, who are fired up uh, that their rights are being taken away. And, you mm -hmm. know, they're not just going to the polls. They're advocating for candidates like Trish and for organizations like Planned Parenthood or Pro-Choice yeah. and Milk. And they're bringing their friends to the polls and their daughters to the polls. Um, yeah, I'm excited. I think uh, it'll be fun to watch this election. So I talked about in the opening statement, I talked about, um, you know, likelihood of upcoming disappointment in a lot of races, because I think it's going to be easy for folks on the left to talk themselves into into that narrative, right, that there's going to be so much of a groundswell that it's going to be enough to win races that statistically are very hard to win, not unwinnable, but very hard to win. The Missouri Senate race is a good example. Trish in the, in the second district is a good example of a race that with the gerrymandering changes with the, what they did to that district, right? Ray, you're mm -hmm. Sean. I mean, all, all of us are familiar with that, but Sean's working in that district, Ray, you were running in that district and, and now helping out there. So, you know, the way that they have changed those lines made it a more difficult uphill battle. And, you know, Sean, what do you, do you get a sense of that? What Ray's talking about that there's going to be enough of that? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I'm looking at the, uh, the 538, numbers for Sharice David's race, the congressional mm -hmm. race in Kansas, the only competitive one. She's an incumbent running in Johnson County and those surrounding areas. And she's a Democrat. And um, the Republicans have a high quality, you know, seemingly normal lady <laughs> running against Sharice David's. She's raising money, not nearly as much as uh, Congresswoman David's. But since August 29th, Sharice uh, David's has you know, really improved her position to where now she is favored to win when it was a yeah, yeah. toss up, or even she was the underdog, you know, before August 29th. So that's a big show. I think, yeah, yeah. Um, it really is, especially in a place like that, you know, where it's like people kind of know what they think about politics in Johnson County. It's like 96% mm -hmm. white. <laughs> it's like, right, right. Um, you know, they're, they pay attention, you know, some of them do, some of them don't, but um, there's not a lot of swings happening around there. So I think that's a, you know, a, a sign of the, the abortion, uh, the impact, the impact of the Dobbs decision. Um, when it comes to tax cuts, I think, you know, it could help Missouri Democrats if they're able to tie it. This is just my own hypothesis to schools, to public school funding, and the insane, out of touch, extremist attack on public schools that's being waged by the Missouri MAGA Republicans. You know, I just looked it up, 32% of school funding in Missouri comes from the state government on average. So, you know, when you right. cut the state budget by $2 billion, that's the number that they ended up with. Parson said it was going to be 700 million. It came back at $2 billion. And, you know, I think the irresponsible nature of what they're doing um, is easier to see if you can kind of connect it to something because on its face, you know, most people do support tax cuts. Yeah, there was, uh, Rachel, I went from a messaging standpoint. So, you know, there's been lots of good <clears throat> Twitter fare. You mentioned Twitter's not going to get the job done here. Uh, Representative uh, Maggie Nuremberg had a, a a good way to tie it back to schools, public safety, social services, healthcare, critical infrastructure, uh, Toter hitting back at Eric Schmidt talking about, you know, your party's fighting to give tax cuts to the wealthiest Missourians and you're trying to make being born wealthy seem worse than taking the money from hard earned, uh, you know, Missourians uh, as Schmidt's going after, you know, Trudy Bush Valentine for being uh, rich. Um, meanwhile, you know, we've got Ray, you know, just talked about out knocking doors. Lucas Kuntz is out knocking doors. Right. This, this message is uh, getting tied in, it sounds like. It's Trudy's to carry, honestly. Right. Yeah. If right. anyone's going to make some kind of case. But yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So, Rachel, is that do you think that that is the, you know, the combo for folks is the the abortion education in infrastructure, kind of like the triad, basically, if we can put those three things together and stay in that lane, so to speak? What? 
what I've kind of so there was a poll that we were chatting about on Twitter this week that uh, came out on mm-hmm. the Hill that said that you know talked about Schmidt's like double digit lead. He's up by eleven two. points with yeah. ten ten percent undecided, three yeah. percent who are going to vote for somebody else, meaning that the math is pretty tough. Yeah. So in that same article, and I'm going to beat this drum again because you guys know I love to do it. It talks about how Trudy Bush Valentine is greatly favored by younger voters. So. Raise, raise Gen, uh, the Gen Zers and the Millens, um, big fan, like our, I think she's favored by like 70% of them or something. Right. Heck and yeah. then on the, on the flip side, um, uh, Schmidt has the favorability of older voters. How many, according to this article, which really does remind me of the research that I did at some point, how many voters, what percentage of eligible voters in Missouri are over 50 or 50 and above a lot 60 percent that's a big number so you're talking about people who still buy this nonsense about republicans being good for the economy and this also this nonsense that when you give tax cuts to the wealthiest people in the world that money is going to somehow trickle down to everyone else right um, it's not going to go into stock buybacks. It's not going to go into, you know, uh, whatever the fuck rich people buy. I don't know. Uh, corporate, corporate welfare basically is what it is. Um, so do I think until we have significant demographic changes in Missouri, right? is that going to make, is that going to move the needle? I, I think the, what I would advise um, uh, Trudy Bush Valentine's campaign to do is to talk about abortion and if we're going to talk about schools, talk about the agape school. Right. Hammer Eric Schmidt's ass over the fact that our attorney general doesn't have the skill set to close down a school right. that is being staffed by people who are abusing, raping, imprisoning, and literally enslaving and also, by the way, kidnapping children. Right. So. I think if she hits on those... And no and one's she... really debating that issue. Like, everybody kind of agrees that that's what's going on. So, why... And the way that... Yeah, the, the Apollo... Well, he's doing the best he can. No, he isn't. He's not trying no, at he's all. Not, he's yeah. like, he's, 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 you know, he's, he's, uh, he likes baseball metaphors, right. right? So, to me, he's just walking the ball. I don't know. Like, he's just like, I'm just going to stand here and you're going to throw balls at me and I'm not even going to bother raise. Like, that's, I'm just going to. That's not a baseball metaphor. I don't no. even know what the fuck you know what I mean. Yeah. I don't know what I mean. He's not like, he's not he's, like. He's hitting loud outs. He's getting, he's making contact, but they're catching it well before the warning. But track. I feel like he's it just not even right. but it's really trying. Nothing. He's not it, like, is, is, what's the thing where the batter tries to get fouled? You know, I don't know. He's walking. To... He, you could say he's watching the pitch go by. Yeah. Um, One might say go. Rachel has okay. mixed her it off. Okay. Right. So... My father, my father always tells me never to talk about sports, but he's not trying. Was my point. He's not trying. So I think that if she's, go- if I were uh, in her communication team or any state office it doesn't matter like yeah 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 i would i would i would run ad after 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 ad everywhere all the time saying this asshole who's the most powerful law enforcement officer in the state of missouri can't do his job right yeah. So we does he doesn't deserve a promotion. Right. And oh, by the way, he also signed that trigger law that now made abortion illegal in the state. Why would you vote for him for Senate? Yeah. And that so, message yeah. will trickle down. Um, Ray, if, yeah, I wanted to, to give a little frame here and then let you finish this up on this topic. So yeah. one of the things that Rachel hit on was the demographic issue. Uh, mm-hmm. I know, you know, you and I talked. I know that part of what you had hopes for in your primary race was young voters. And mm-hmm. we know it didn't, right, you didn't get the turnout you needed. So, you know, how do we, A, how do we get more of those folks to actually show up? Because that's the whole, that's my whole problem is like, when you tell me, well, if the Republicans can turn out their base, they win, or if the Democrats can turn out their base, they win. But if the Democratic base is a group of people who historically don't turn out. And when there's less than half of them in the state. Right. Right. So or something yeah. like that. Ray, how, you yeah. know, what do you think about that? And then, and close us out on this topic. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a lot of messaging, you know. Uh, Trudy has a unique opportunity with Eric Schmidt. He's not Eric Greitens, but he's still an awful candidate. Um, so, yeah, Trudy, she's got a, the campaign, Democrats in general, had to remind folks, uh, especially those older folks, that this ain't your dad's Republican Party anymore. And Eric Schmidt is not yeah. Ronald Reagan in the least bit. Um, but on our side, Joe Biden is 
FDR on steroids. I mean, he's been the most progressive president since President Roosevelt. Um, and Trudy and her job in the Senate, and this connects to how she's going to talk to my, how she should talk to my generation. Uh, she wants to help Joe Biden build on all the progress that he's made in these only only first two years. I mean, infrastructure has been done, Inflation Reduction Act, the stimulus package, chips. Uh, Democrats are delivering, yeah. and there's so much more that we want to do. And Trudy has a unique opportunity to be a part of that. Um, and so many of the goals of the Democratic Party appeal most to my generation. So I think just, you know, communicating that is going to go a long way. Well said. Let's uh, let's move. That was we got that right on time. I just want to say we run a timer for the show, and we absolutely nailed that. So I'm very happy about that. All right, moving on. Yeah, no, yeah. All right, this week's yeah, no uh, comes to us courtesy of Rachel. Uh, she gets credit for for plucking this one. Uh, U.S. Republicans taking victory laps for a fascist election in Italy. Uh, specifically from Mary Elizabeth Coleman, who said nothing is more terrifying to the left than a conservative woman. Rachel, uh, why don't you, you know, do, do, do the thing that you do? <laughs> so, <laughs> go That's ahead. for all of us. Yeah. No, so, so should I do another baseball metaphor? No, that one. I don't think go that's well. necessary. Okay. If all you right. Will. All right. Um, yeah. It's so, I just I gave you a grapefruit. There you go. Okay. There you go. All right. I don't. Okay. So so so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> They're making fun of me. I should not have made a sports. We're joke. laughing all with right. you. Okay. You're not. You're laughing at me. Um. It's fine. No, so, okay, so last week, Italy had parliamentary elections, uh, and that's, it's it's very different uh, than the United States, the way they do elections, they elect parties, and the, um, the, fasc the neo-fascist party uh, won the majority of seats, and so now they still have to form a government, and they still have to do all these things, and they're not quite done yet, but it looks like the, um, uh, the next prime minister of Italy is going to be this... Giorgia Maloney. Yeah. Um, I wish I could remember what Kara Swisher nicknamed her. Uh, Mussolini or something like that. Mussolini, she her... yeah. Yeah, she calls her little Mussolini. That's um, good. She is, uh, so this woman uh, is is just a human dog whistle with frosted blonde hair. Right. Um, she, uh, I, I don't know that she could be any more terrifying to anyone who's a big fan of democracy um, she's not a big fan of LGBTQ people. She hates immigrants. Um, she has said some distinctly anti-Semitic things yeah. many, many, many times. Um, she's definitely racist. Uh, she thinks that, you know, women should stay in the home. If you know anything about fascist Italy, this should give you, um, a moment of pause, uh, to understand just how, uh, we are in perilous times right now, particularly in, um, in Central Europe, I mean, we talked about this like way back. I remember being on the when I first started, um, kind of hanging out with you guys in the podcast, and we were talking about the, I think it was the G8 summit, and uh, we were talking about how like everybody got in the room with Biden for the first time, and everybody was looking at him like, oh, dude, you are old, and we are fucked, because <laughs> it was Boris Johnson and Angela Merkel had not yet retired, and you know they had very successful elections in Germany. Um, you know, England right now is shitting the bed in a bad way. Liz Truss's first week was not good. Um, so this leaves Italy. And so the Republicans have decided the way to, to way, the way to own the libs right now is to celebrate this woman. Right. right. Is to be like, oh, Maloney, the liberals don't like her because she's strong. And liberals are afraid of strong conservatives. I'm not afraid of strong conservative women. I am afraid of fascism taking over Italy and Spain again. Right, again. Because the last time that happened... About 100 there, years ago. There were problems, yeah. right? Like, really, <clears throat> lot, millions of people were murdered. Um, so, anybody... I don't even... Like, it is the ultimate yeah, no. And I, by the way, like, I... I invited, I mean, kind of in a snarky way, I didn't really think she was going to fucking take me up on it, but I did invite one Mary uh, Elizabeth Coleman to come on the podcast and talk about yeah, what open. it is about an open anti-Semite uh, and um, racist uh, that she likes so fucking much. Um, and if she would like to talk to me about what happened to my grand, my great-grandfather, 
when he had to flee Eastern Europe uh, uh, just before the uh, turn of the 20th fucking century yeah. because um, he was in, he was, uh, my, 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 my parents called it um, uh, indentured. And I looked that mm. up when I was older and I was like, wait, that's just a slave basically. Yeah. So like my great grandfather was indentured in Romania. Like he would never talk about all the things that happened to him because he was Trump. So anyway, that's what I think of when I think of somebody who talks about how people like, mm there's a very specific dog whistle when it comes to people that are allowed to lend money. Yeah. So fuck you and fuck all this fucking praise of her. And that's all I have to say. It's like the ultimate. Yeah. No, just the simple context on it. So Maloney, this is a quote from the Washington post in her decade as leader of Fratelli d'Italia brothers of Italy. Maloney has espoused some extreme positions. She has advocated for the dissolution of the Eurozone and has warned conspiratorially that unnamed forces are guiding immigrants en masse to Italy in the name of ethnic substitution. Ray, that sound like anything that you've heard before? Literally never. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty wild stuff. Uh, Sean, anything? Is, is this is this one of those things that's bubbled up at all that the fascists have taken over Italy? Um, you know, only because I watch so much PBS. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a very but, big deal. I mean, like it's th- the fact that like the Republicans are being assholes, but it's a very big deal in Europe for sure. Right. So all the fancy news people were talking. Yeah. About and it. like as part of the same story, you know, Bolsonaro is down in Brazil and, um, right. you know, a lot of the same sort of threads, you know, he has been casting doubts on their elections for months now because he might lose and Trump recently endorsed him. Um, Trump's tearing down the uh, he's just exploding the Republican Party here, um, which is really, really fun to watch. Yeah. Um, And then meanwhile, he's like, hey, if you live in Sao Paulo, grab a ballot for (laughs) Bolsonaro. Yeah. Um, So I think the Republicans are going to keep flirting with neo fascists because they think it gets us upset. But like you guys are the ones who look like fascists. fascists. Yeah. 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 We're not really upset about the crazy people you support yeah we're gonna split hairs here donnie there's been a threatening castration so (laughs) (laughs) it's come on well yeah no well let's uh let's move on here all right the buyer sell as we get into this i'm going to switch over uh I'm, i'm double shouting out so i'm switching from a log boat knot hole which is their Oktoberfest, which has a little uh raccoon got a fellow with a corn cob pipe and a raccoon tail coming out of a stump uh, and it's delicious and i'm switching to my mother's oktoberfest which is also amazing and delicious and i highly recommend it if you can find it both are wonderful missouri beers we still don't have a missouri an official missouri beer sponsor of the podcast so uh you know four hands mothers log boat uh urban chestnut you know we're here yeah we're open we're open. We're for cheap it. too. We're so cheap. Yeah. We yeah. can be bought easily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've had internal discussions. We'll sell out. So you just let us know. All right. Uh, so the buyer sell is uh, that the, the GOP can walk it back uh, on abortion. So uh, this came out on the 27th in the Missouri Independent. The headline uh, this is by a story from Jennifer Shutt, I think is how you would say that on the Missouri Independent, and there's, the headline is Republicans in Congress say they'd keep federal abortion funding in cases of rape incest. Ray, uh, your time in, in D.C. recently, how much of the abortion conversation is just, like, is it just permeating life there? I can't say it is. Uh, well, that's, that's maybe a good thing. Yeah, it it is. Um I think it's mostly, it is just talk. Um, it's just talk to get those Ann Wagners out to vote. Um, the folks uh, who identify, unfortunately, exactly how Ann, Ann Wagner does on the um, issue of abortion. Um, they just want to rile that that pro-life base up, or the so-called pro-life base up. Um, it's just talk. It'll never come to fruition, in my opinion. Do you think they can walk back the messaging, though, at this point? I mean, if we're, you know, we just got done talking about how Democrats have to push, push, push on, you know, it's a federal ban, federal ban, federal ban. Like, those should be the two lang- two words most associated with abortion and Republicans right now for voters. Oh, yeah. Do you think that the, you know, as you're knocking doors, do you think that folks are going to be receptive to these guys who are suddenly like, I mean, I would let some abortions happen. Like, is that yeah, enough? Yeah, yeah. 
they're going to have to walk it back because the right to choose is incredibly popular um, across the entire country. Um, if they want to win elections uh, in the future, they're going to have to walk it back. Sean, what do you think? Do you think it is even possible at this point, like with what, four weeks basically uh, to the general five weeks, I guess, to the general that they can get from where it is right now to where they're going to have to be. I mean, it, you look at all the models. I don't care if you're looking at 538 or The Economist or any, you know, if you're reading Cook Political Report, uh, it's been consistently shifting toward Democrats, even with some like slight market correction uh, back toward Republicans. The the shift is still pretty heavy. Yeah, totally. So it makes me think of 2010, 12 years ago, when all of us started saying, I think the Republican Party is going to overreach <laughs> <laughs> and and it's going to hurt them. And, um, and, you know, sometimes it has and sometimes it hasn't, right? So like in 2012, Democrats won again. Um, but then, you know, they did explode the Republican Party. And we saw that in Trump being the next Republican president after Obama. You know, if they win back the House, we'll, we'll really see an explosion. Because then they'll be the chairs of all the committees. And so right. you'll have Jason Smith over at budget having some abortion budget thing that he's trying to push. Right. And then you'll have Louis Gohmert over in whatever committee he's in pushing <sighs> oh something God. he's doing. He might have left Congress, Louis actually. Louis Gohmert. Um, but yeah, like the House will not be able to not talk about abortion. And I don't think Republican politicians... Well, and what else are they going to do, right? If the Democrats win the Senate, <laughs> right. and, it, and it looks like the Democrats <laughs> could win with 52... 53, 54 is not out of the question in the Senate. So it's not like the Republicans can send something over that's even going to get the light of day, right? Right. And Mitch McConnell can't do anything about the calendar. Right. Um, so the House Republicans, yeah, they, you know, I, I would imagine that they'll take this up. I just read an article recently about it, it quoted a bunch of Republican House members, and I think maybe senators too, talking about how they just, backed off of the idea that they're going to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Um, right. They don't they don't really say why. No, they just they Homer <laughs> Simpson into off. the bushes on that. Just just yeah. right on back and just came out with abortion on the top of their head instead of right. the Affordable but it's Care like, Act. It seems like it might be pretty convenient for them if they'd rather talk about something that's not a national abortion ban. Maybe they could, you know, uh, do, do that you think that, that tackling Obama is going to help them? No, I, you know, I can't, I don't think there can be helped. I think we are going to watch this, you know, burn down um, yeah. because they're so hung up right now on, you know, a lot of these policies, they're going to be fighting over the the health of the mother. They're like, well, we're okay with the life of the mother, but if it's the health of the mother too, that's going to be too much leeway for like, I guess, I don't know, the mother and the doctor <laughs> to decide right. Right. instead of the politicians. And um it's fucking insane, but they're not going to be able to help themselves. And so that's what I think. Um, Rachel, yeah. it seems to me like, it, don't get me wrong, the GOP has never had any problem, the, 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 especially this modern version of talking out of both sides of their mouth while talking out of their ass at the same time. Um, so do you think that at this point, like, is it possible that people are actually so engaged on this particular issue that it's just impossible to actually – Car, like claw back the things that they have said i mean no i uh, don't at all um so if the buyer sell is can the gop walk it back and my i'm yeah. i'm so I'm, I'm selling that i'm not gonna buy it i don't think there is there's no way it's a little bit like when it, it's I'm, I'm glad sean brought up the aca because when trump won up to that point i i cannot remember how many times obama had to repeal had to veto an aca repeal right right a 10 or something i it was so it was so cartoonish the house right? repealed it like 150 times or more i don't yeah. know how yeah. many times the senate like when they had the senate majority right it was under so obama, it was so yeah. it was so bananas it was just like oh here's another one um so i you know I, it was you know and it was it was it wasn't even really it had barely been instituted and i know that they were trying to like just undermine its uh undermine the effect of it because they knew it was going to be once people started to understand how robust it was compared to what we had before which was again once again fucking nothing uh it was going to certainly become a much more popular um marketplace right people are actually going to start um uh using the insurance and so forth people like me um and the walk back was not repeal 
The walk back was repeal and replace. Repeal and replace. Like, we have right. to replace You're it right. now. Totally we have a plan. We have, have a to replace plan. it. And they didn't fucking have an idea they didn't have what they plan. were going to replace it with. They, they didn't know what the hell they... <laughs> no, they did. It was called the, the American Health Care oh, Act. Health Care Act, right. The AHCA, which the is the thing. Big down. Which was, right, right. McCain. Like, yeah. okay, Senator McCain, I have to like you a little bit. You and Liz Cheney. Um, well, because so... they just, they kept they kept doing it with this like disingenuous well, we have a plan too and then it was like yeah but the whole well and it was like the right. most important part of the affordable care act is the pre-existing condition portion like the rest of it is squishy stuff that can be moved around and we can do different versions of that kind, kind of that's what they discovered no you can't like you actually have to have a marketplace right that insurance companies submit plans to and there's a whole infrastructure to it, and it is extremely complicated it is very hard to uncouple it all together they discovered that because voters were like uh, they realized like voters were like you were gonna kill you if you get rid of well, our health care and so people I, figured out that it worked right people figured out that it was it super easy been, to sign up for right. it totally worked they were getting right. to see the same dot like it did exactly what it was supposed right. to do and it is not perfect and and there are days when i have to deal with it where i'm just like oh my god what i have to sign up for a plan every fucking year why can't i just keep the same insurance like you do on medicare like where you you basically like, medicare you sign up and you can just keep that plan for like, it just rolls over and I got to go through the exchange every year and it's sort of nerve wracking, whatever. And we still have an expanded Medicaid and uh, Missouri and it's, there's, there's definitely flaws to it, but this to me feels like that. And they don't have a plan. They can't walk it back. You can't take things away from people. That is one of my themes. There's two, there's two themes that, that, that I say a lot. One is that we live in a gerontocracy. The other one is you cannot take shit away from people. It's why we can't control guns in this country right. because people don't want to give things up. So They've committed one of the great political sins that exists in the world, which is that people have a freedom, the freedom to be able to go get health care. It's fucking health care. It's just goddamn health care. That's all it fucking is. It drives me crazy when people say, well, it's a medical. They're all fucking medical abortions. Yeah. I get that there's also pharmaceutical abortions. But the idea that like that. So there is no position for them. There's no beachhead for them to find on this issue. They are fucked i think um and i think what's going to happen is that the, the republican party itself is going to be in this constant snake eating its own tail thing for a while because even liz cheney won't come out as pro-choice now like right. just girl just if liz cheney came out as pro-choice tomorrow she could be the president right right period no problem she would have a she would have a lane to, but they won't even let go of it they're so fucked that's my that's my that's my <laughs> stance so, Ray, with this issue, you know, of taking away, like Rachel saying, taking away the freedom as you're knocking doors, are you are you getting that back from people? Like, are you dealing with folks who, you know, identify maybe even as Republicans who are upset by this being taken away? Like, is that specifically coming through? Yeah, 100 um, percent. And with a candidate like Trish in the second district or Trudy Bush or Trudy, yeah, Trudy Bush Valentine uh, running for Senate. Um, we have Democratic candidates who have shown at every turn that they're willing to fight and protect uh, every every woman's act, access to abortion, and it's drawing a lot of uh, favorability with folks uh, in those rural and uh, suburban areas, like the second district. Um, I think I think it gives us a chance in November. Sean, is it something that, you know, you, you work on a lot of campaigns, um, you know, without obviously giving us inside information that you can't share? Uh, are there numbers that suggest that this is not just an issue that's helping turn out Democrats, that it's more than that, that it's flipping voters? I would bet that it's flipping more voters from you know, on the fence about voting in the midterm to like, I'm definitely voting in the midterm and I'm voting because of abortion. Those are numbers that we are seeing. Um, similar to the um, the threats to democracy on the, on the democratic side or, you know, progressive leaning voters. Um, absolutely, yeah, it's coming through in the numbers. And, you know, one race that I'm thinking of a lot is this US Senate race here in Colorado. So Michael Bennett, yeah is an incumbent u.s senator he ran for president um he's well respected around here and he's been chair of the dscc before and he um he's got this challenger named joe o'day who's like a millionaire construction guy construction on company owner and 
he won his Republican primary saying, I was endorsed by all the pro-life groups. I'm pro-life. I'm going to move the pro-life movement forward. And now he's trying to act like he's the one Republican in the country who is pro-choice. He's running ads. Blake Masters is trying to pretend too down in Arizona, right? Oh, Jesus Christ. Are you kidding me? Yeah, he scrubbed all of his website and, and changed all of his language. Oh, wow. Okay. Well... Yeah, he has definitely changed what he's saying. But O'Day is actually trying to say he's pro-choice. Like his daughter went on an ad and said, my dad has always supported a woman's right to choose in his construction business, I guess, because he's never run for anything. And then now when he talks about it, he really demurs and tries to sidestep the question. He says, you know, there was a there was a so-called heartbeat bill on the ballot here a few years ago, Proposition 115. And on a radio interview or you know something with the pro-life organizations he cited that he had voted for that bill when he was seeking their support <laughs> um and now when he's asked about it he says you know i wouldn't have written that bill i wouldn't run a bill like that but you know what i'm hoping voters will think about is like this dude's running for the united states senate one of their main jobs is confirming judges and the idea that Roe versus Wade is overturned, all that means is that we no longer have a court approved right to abortion in this country at that level. But right. there are all these district courts and appellate courts who are going to be deciding on birth control. Yeah. And, you know, this issue is going to come up in a, in a same million sex different marriage, ways. Same sex yeah. marriage. Yeah, right. Yeah. And if he's voting, acting like, you know, voting rights. Yeah. So yeah. Much. It's like he shouldn't be a U.S. senator if he doesn't have an issue on this or it doesn't have a doesn't have a position on this issue. Um, but in 2014, Cory Gardner was a Republican. And in Colorado, I was knocking on doors for Mark Udall and he lost that election after what I thought was a message that was, you know, all about abortion and, yeah. you know, really trying to pin Cory Gardner with this extremist pro-life sort of position. And he was able to escape that. And then he, you know, was a senator for six years and then we booted him out of office because he voted with Trump 99% of the time. Yeah. And Trump lost in Colorado by like nine points. So, yeah, I, I'm interested to see what happens in statewide races in like Wisconsin, you know, Pennsylvania. Yeah. This dude's fucking nuts, Mastriano, and he's yeah. toast. He's toast. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's, he's, toast. Running. He, he's out of money, he's right? Isn't he yeah. basically just out of money? He yeah. never had any money. He never really had it, much of a campaign. <laughs> yeah, he's getting annihilated. Um, so he yeah, just asked it's going to be interesting. Him, literally, you know, look, he did, looking at the you know NPR's got a. This is from early September, but basically showing inflation is still the top issue. Thirty uh, percent of voters across the board, and followed by abortion. And that if you take that to independents and Republicans. It's not as big an issue with Democrats. And, you know, we can talk all day long about abortion messaging, but everybody is buying things every day and feeling the, you know, feeling inflation. And people are looking at people who vote are also people who check their IRA and their 401k. And I don't know if you guys have looked at yours recently. No, but it's not, a fun, not, it's not a fun. Not a fun exercise. Never... <laughs> it's not a fun thing to do. Well, right no, now. but I no. can. But I'm just going to say in this poll amongst Democrats, abortion is favored it by 39 percent and 13 percent. So a Democrats number one issue is abortion. Yeah. Uh, independence. It's it's a it's, it's a, a distant clear second, number, but, but it's clear still a two. second. Yeah. yeah, but it's still number two, and that could also. You know, inflation is sort of a mercurial thing. I mean, it is coming down. Um, I don't know when they did this poll or where they did this poll or who they talked to. Uh, but and you what's know, interesting about or sorry, go ahead. This is a you know, twelve hundred person poll and, end end of August. Yeah. So so inflation actually, when you see the markets come down, that's that that's deflationary. That's more of a sign of like, oops, the daisy right, might be a right. recession. Um, so there's lots of things that go into that, but I do. Um, I don't really have anything to add to that except that I just can't believe that like, I, you know, I went to high school in Colorado. Um, Colorado is in many ways the home of the modern Christian right. Uh, and not in many ways, it kind of is the home of the modern right, Christian yeah. right. So to, to see that we're there in Colorado gives me some hope. I just think we have to be really realistic in places where there's not a lot of young people. And that's the unfortunate reality of this country is that a lot of races are decided in districts where there's not a lot of young people. It's not yeah. that they don't show up. They're just not there. So anyway, 
Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to say about inflation really fast. So like we fret about how voters see inflation because Democrats are in power with the you know White House, House and the Senate. But for a voter to conclude that electing Republicans will not immediately or ever have a magical impact on inflation that wouldn't already happen by the actions the Fed is taking and the way Biden's dealing with it. Like that would be the correct conclusion. And I always say like voters are not stupid. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah. That's right. That's right. So, you know, they can say they're most worried about inflation and then they can still vote on something else or they can also dismiss the idea that Republicans are going to somehow be better. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the big one. And now the big one. All right. The big one this week is the Senate's Electoral Count Act. Uh, it has passed. Uh, and let me take a quick uh, glance here. This is a one sheet. There'll be a link to this so you can get uh, lots of information it in the show a, sheet this week. Is, it hasn't passed. It, it's out of committee. It's out of committee. Sorry. It's a pass out of committee with one yeah. no vote. Guess who? Everybody. <laughs> Theodore Cruz. <laughs> Theodore. Sorry, just had to... Tetterling. Uh, so the Electoral Account Reform Act uh, would, this is from the one sheet, so I'm just going to read this little part of it for context. Uh, it would, this is not a repeal of the Electoral College. This is a reforming how they count the electoral votes that are being submitted. Uh, it would reform and modernize the outdated 1887 Electoral Count Act to ensure that electoral votes tallied by Congress accurately reflect each state's public vote for president. It would replace ambiguous provisions of the 19th century law with clear procedures that maintain appropriate state and federal roles in selecting the president and vice president of the United States as set forth in the U.S. Constitution. That's the first time I've read that, and I did that uh, cold, so, you know, snaps to me for for getting through that without messing it up. Um, Ray, you've, again, this was the fourth time I've said this probably, but you've been in D.C. recently. Uh, any literal inside baseball uh, on this one, or I guess inside softball uh, on this one that you can uh, share with us? Yeah, um, I think in D.C. the feeling is more that those uh, January 6th, the last few January 6th committees that we have, I know the last one was uh, rescheduled because of the what's going on in Florida with the Hurricane Ian. Right, right, right. Um, but I think the feeling more is that that's the best way to educate the public because I can read, you know, text from bills till I'm blue in the face um, to voters, but it's not sexy for them. Um, I think I think prime time uh, hearing damning evidence about how one side doesn't matter, Democrat, Democrat or Republican, one side of a political party um, in the United States tries to overturn an election. And while bills we can, you know, implement bills to make the to make the public, you know, kind of restore faith and trust into our electoral system. Uh, we got to modernize it in those January 6th committees, uh, committee meetings I think coming up are going to be really good for voters in the coming election. So this one looks like uh, there, there's an older story on Axios, uh, a much older story from July about sort of when this bubbled up. This is a bipartisan bill. Uh, Senator Susan Collins and Joe Manchin. So if you want to know how bipartisan this is, Susan Collins and Joe Manchin are the ones associated with it. So like, it's like a very, it's like a super signal, right? Of like, Hey, we're sending the two people that nobody can get to do what the fuck they're supposed to do <laughs> most of the time well, I guess to, the other, to put their names on it I'll together. Say like, the flip side of that is that by some measure, they are seen by the American public as the moderates in the Senate. Right, that's right, the reputation right. they have, whether it's right. true or not. But that's the that's kind of the earned income uh, reputation they both have. <laughs> the earned income reputation. <laughs> that's a good way to put that. Uh, one of the things it's trying to do is basically make it clear that the vice president doesn't have any power, that he's just there to basically read the stuff and you know hit a big hammer onto a big piece of wood. Uh, and that's really all it's for. Uh, but yeah, I came out of committee with the one no vote. Uh, Sean, what do, you, what do you think about this? Do you think that this is, you know, overall, this is a good thing. This is a bad thing. This is a useful thing. You know, where does this sort of fit into your bag oh, of, of tools? I'm so glad you asked the question that way because I don't think it matters at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I asked it that way because I, I knew you would have a very clear take on that. Yeah. And I mean, the reason I say that is because I'm always, you know, I say voters aren't stupid and I say politicians need to talk about people's lives. Yeah. And, you know, this is not something that's really about people's lives. It's Ooh, about Sean and literally I are gonna, what politicians do. Sean and I are going to 
Sean and I are going to disagree. I'm going to have to get That's a drop awesome. for that in the future. Go ahead. What, Sean and I disagree? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. So it's like, you can say the government is about people's lives, but there are a lot of laws and things that get talked about by people in government that's really just all about government. And a lot right. of people feel left right. out of that conversation. Um, I'll isn't, also isn't say, it a fair argument that, you know, if you take a look at what happened on January 6th and you take a look at how all of this went down, that right. that did impact people's lives? So January 6th definitely did. And so I guess before I said, I don't think it matters. I did kind of go through in my head, like, would this have prevented January 6th? And, you know, first of all, what happened in January 6th There's an argument that it could have still happened even with this in place. Right. And also what happened on January 6th is that the electors were counted and the election was not overturned by some weird flaw in the old electoral count. Thanks to a phone call with Dan Quayle. (laughs) I I was thinking about how they had to shoot that lady. (laughs) Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> But yeah, it's like, but um, I was looking at the first, so the, the first electoral count act was passed about 10 years after the disputed 1876 election, where Rutherford Hayes won in basically a deal, like a basically handshake gave deal. away reconstruction to the South and said, look, you guys want to put all the rules in place so that we can get rid of elected black senators and representatives and so that black people can't Jurors. vote anymore. Here you go. Here you go. Go be racist. We're not going to, we're not going to bother you anymore. And like that happened because states did send competing slates of electors, just like Trump and Eastman and those idiots criminals were trying to do. Um, And, and it was a, you know, that was a big failure of our, you know, ability to count the damn electors, I think. But I think this year, you know, in 2020, we got it done. Um, even though there was a violent attempt to, you know, keep the senators from counting them. Um, I will say that I would predict it will get passed during the lame duck session. Um, I think they only have like seven Republican senators who have said they are supporting it right now. You know, most I think the last I saw was, was nine. Oh, okay. I think think it's closer. Yeah. It's like, it's, I think it's getting closer to 11. One of which of course is Mitch McConnell. Yeah. I think they're like within two of the, of the uh, filibuster threshold at this point. Yeah. But yeah, like someone like Portman, if he's not on the record, he'll vote for it on Port- the way out. Portman's on the record. Same thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Cornyn, I think Portman was a big part of it, actually. Um, uh, overall. That makes so, sense. and 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 then it, and you get the further push with McConnell, basically, not you know he's not making a huge show of it, but it's basically another chance for him to say to you know former President Trump, you know, fuck off, buddy. Like we we're not right. buying it. So Rachel, like you it. disagree with Sean. Why do you disagree with Sean? Well, I I think that we came much closer to peril um, than I'm not saying that Sean doesn't think that we were in danger on January 6th, but um, I think that that basically this cuts off this, like when you look at all the different ways that um, Trump's allies tried to disrupt a democratic election, the, the, my biggest concern was the slate of fate, the slate of fake electors, right? That was a very big deal. And putting too much ability in the House of Representatives for two people, one in each chamber, to say, I don't like these results. And so it was super easy for them to just completely. And when you talk about how democracies fail, what's interesting, like if you look at um, and you can watch the very excellent show Narcos, by the way, on Netflix, uh, which does a brilliant job of recreating um, just how democracy got gutted in Mexico they didn't change the outcome of the election. They they fucked with the voting machine. So they did what Trump claimed that they did, right? They actually screwed with the the data that came out of the voting machines, not the right, votes themselves, right. but the data that came out so that when people were going to the... They basically made it look like the opposition was losing so that people stopped voting that day. And so then the opposition won and just completely destroyed... Uh, right. democratic norms in Mexico. So the way that 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 um, people typically disrupt electoral processes is they want time, right? They want to put they want to put lots of minutes on the clock to sow doubt, to sow dissent. So if you say you can't just fucking say I don't like the way the election went because I'm Josh Howley and I'm going to get one of my Nimrod fucking colleagues on the other side of the uh, uh, on, in the other house in the other chamber to say the same thing. No, now you're going to need either Liz Cheney wanted a full third. It looks like Mitch McConnell's kind of virtue signaling to his idiots 
in his chamber and they want more like a fifth, but you're actually going to have to go whip votes. Right. So instead of just raising your hand and being like, I dissent, you're actually going to have to go out on the floor and whip votes and get your other colleagues to agree with you. And you're going to have to do the same thing in both sides. Right. So it's yeah. going to take a much stronger effort. And I think those two things I would, we were talking about um, voter reform early on in kind of the history of this podcast. I remember people like, uh noam chomsky and um probably some folks at the intercept who i can't remember exactly right now saying that like it's we have an uphill battle when it comes to blocking um voter suppression but the one thing that seems to be bipartisan is election reform like actually yeah. just saying like if we put these things in place it'll make it that much more difficult for someone as deranged and also popular as trump to put the time on the clock that they need to get people to overthrow a government. We got lucky this last time that the people who were uh, on the, the lawn were first of all outnumbered um, by ultimately by the national guard. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't particularly well organized. They're not that fucking smart. They were not that well funded. They're not that well coordinated. If it had been another group of people, um that were perhaps a bit more harmonized together and not so outlandishly um fringy if right. that had been a more mainstream kind of group of people i don't i don't like them odd so i'm um i'm you know i i actually think that liz cheney's bill that she introduced by the way liz cheney introduced a very similar bill in the house which passed which the, the did house not, bill hers didn't pass the house no. passed the bill the, the house passed her bill but oh sorry it did pass um but the set it didn't make its way to the senate the senate gutted right, the it the senate's passing changed, its yeah. own yeah, yeah it's its own bill so what's sad sorry i should i should have been clarified what i said nobody in her party i think one republican in the house voted for it yeah that's how much that that's how much they still are trying to like virtue signal to trump that they love him that no, i'm sure they all believe and agree with her 100 percent. i don't even like this woman and yeah. i was like you guys are shitting all over her now like i understand that you guys don't like her little january 6 thing but all you had to do was say yeah this all makes sense to me this is totally fine so yeah it does this is the cbs report from the 28th it's got 11 uh republican senate republicans co-sponsoring with mitch mcconnell oh, wow. saying he proudly supports this bipartisan legislation so this looks like it's gonna sail uh absolutely sail through and i imagine it'll get signed pretty quickly even if i and i think I, I would be. not be shocked in fact i will i will totally disagree with sean and this might require some type of bet uh as well a handshake bet here but i bet it gets passed really close really close uh and signed very close to election day oh wow okay i bet biden holds I mean, a signing no, very close to election there's day. no impact i'll bet it's to... closer to christmas than to election day okay well they get but they're going to debate it next week Right. And whatever they pass in the Senate, they're going to pass in the House. So, right. so I don't know. But I, I, I think know, he Sean. holds the signing sometime right, right before the election. Yeah. Ray, uh, you you posted some good pictures uh, from your travels. One of them was a softball game with Senator Klobuchar and others. Uh, did you get a chance to to talk about any meaningful legislation? Did this come up at all, or was it just balls and strikes uh, and baseball metaphors that Rachel would clearly not? uh have understood that's quite enough out of you pal <laughs> that's um, a callback right there baby uh senator klobuchar is first of all amazing and i absolutely love her um yeah co signed from we, this entire podcast yeah <laughs> uh we we talked about the game we talked about our hope for future of democracy uh my generation um i'll take a shot with her she's she's fun to drink with nice oh wow shot of what what's she drink yeah <laughs> She had some kind of like yellow concoction. I was just Fuzzy doing Mabel, I bet that sounds uh, like no. Senator Klobuchar. <laughs> <laughs> it's like some I chartreuse. Could, I could I could see some limoncello. I limoncello. Could see some limoncello. There you go. There you go. There yeah. you go. And I generally I generally don't drink, but when in Rome, it was it was tequila. Um, uh -huh. and it was it was a good time. A good time. I'm. I think I'm speaking for the entire podcast when I say we all would have been a little bit disappointed if you hadn't done a shot with Senator Amy, just like a little, just yeah. like a little bit, yeah, just like a yeah. tiny bit. Yeah. Well, yeah. man, Ray, thanks for joining us. Uh, any any parting words for the for the podheads out there as we you know go into that good night? Um, vote. 
Vote, vote, vote. That's honestly all I got for you. Yeah. Bring your friends, bring your neighbors, bring your neighbor's dog, whatever. Just get them out there. Get them oh, voting. can I just say really quickly before we bail that yeah. I'm about two thirds the way through the interview that you did last week with Bethany. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I Bethany don't, man running in the third district. I Democrat. don't need to be your friend if you don't, if you live in that district and you don't vote for her. Like if you're someone who just, just has to double so down smart. on Luke Tamayer and you can't make your way to vote for that person, um, She's so everything that you guys always say you want in Congress. All yeah. you people that talk about what you really want. What you really want is somebody really... She's everything you people say you want. Um, yeah. I thought she did a great job. I haven't finished the whole... I don't think she's going to bite it in the last like 10 minutes that I haven't finished yet. But no, uh, just just a really great job. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. I just wanted to thank her for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, if I, if I can add... Um, yeah. Like- Trish Gumby is really an amazing candidate in the second district. Like Missouri yeah. is really hard and there are still folks who, you know, really want or are willing to stay in the fight. And Trish is someone who's been in the fight for a long time. Yes, she has. Um, and I, so I encourage like everyone to listen to this pod. You can knock a door for her, make a phone call for her, send a, a couple of dollars for her. Whenever you think you've done enough, one more door, one more dollar, one more phone call. I promise to make all the difference in a district like the second. And Trish has a real shot here. Absolutely. That's true. I will. Yeah. Thank you for saying that, Ray. And like, I've worked on enough campaigns to know that very few actually have a real field operation that really wants to include people. And Trish is one of those campaigns. So like, if you sign up to volunteer, you will be involved. You'll probably get to meet her. You'll definitely be part of a high energy, fun, inclusive campaign. I think it says everything in the world that Ray and Trish ran in that primary and that Ray is knocking doors for her is talking about her on this kind of a show. I think that's that's a lot. I I would say the same thing. Uh, uh, Lucas is out there doing that for statewide candidates, and it's awesome to see. You know, you're two people who built serious profiles, uh, and you're using those profiles in ways that are helping raise the tide. And uh, you know, you don't have to have Ray and Lucas's. You know, you don't have to get on MSNBC or Fox News to be able to do that. Uh, it's uh, everybody can do it, so it's a great thing to emulate and. Uh, encourage everybody to do that so thank you all for for joining me this week i had a good time and uh, i'm gonna go watch chiefs game so go chiefs yeah go chiefs the heartland pod is a production of midmap media llc follow us on twitter with at the heartland pod with email you can reach us heartlandpod2020 at gmail.com online with heartlandpod.com subscribe And please sign up for our Patreon with patreon.com slash heartlandpod. Become a podhead or an official podgressive today and unlock all of our content. See you at the next show.